What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another video from the Scalar Learning Channel in collaboration with Strategic Test Prep. We want to welcome Laura Whitmore, and we are doing a video together in honor of this August SAT coming up where we're doing 10 SAT, digital SAT, I should say, math problems. I'm going to do 10, Laura's going to do 10, and after we kind of do each one, we're going to critique each other, which is going to be super fun. So Laura, first of all, this is super cool that we're going to do a collaboration. How are you feeling today? I'm feeling so good. I'm so happy to be here. Um, I feel like I chose 10 questions that I think are like really, really hard questions because I'm trying to stump you today. All right, well, let's see if you can stump me and we'll see if I can stump you. By the way, if you guys have watched my channel for a while, you know I like fluorescent colors. And by total coincidence, Laura's wearing fluorescent, so we're fluorescent out, uh, fluorescented to the max, if that's a word. All right, without further ado, we're gonna start. And Laura, I'm gonna hit the share screen. And if you're ready, let's get into it. This is your first prom. Take oh my gosh, I'm so excited. All right, I love this problem because it's a system of equations. And usually I say, hey, throw it into Desmos, but this is way too simple to put into Desmos, I think. If you're solving for Y and you notice that you already have additive inverses, cancel the X's out and just add. So you end up with 4Y equals 6. And then you can just go ahead and divide. So then Y is going to equal 3 halves. Done. And and tell us, how did you get from six fourths, uh, six fourths to three halves? Yeah, I just reduced it because you always want to reduce your fractions down. So I divided the top and the bottom by two so that I could get it in the simplest form. Okay, that was awesome. And I would do it the exact same way. This is a question that I like to call a layup where the college board is kind of setting you up for success if you can pick up on it, right? The X's are going to naturally cancel out. So Laura just added these two together and they it just naturally came to this situation where you just have a single variable equation just with Y. Now, she mentioned Desmos. I'm just going to show you really quick how you could do this in Desmos just so you can see and then we'll move on to question two. Negative 3.5. So I'm just typing in the equation as is and it gives us this really nice graph. And then we're going to say X plus 3y equals 9.5. And the cool thing about a system is you're just looking graphically for the intersection, which is right here. And just like Laura said, it gives us that 1.5. Now, she entered it as three over two. Obviously, you can enter it as a decimal as well. But if you're curious what this is as a fraction, you can always plug it in and just go boop like that. And it gives it the same fraction three halves. Oh, I like that. Okay, we got question two queued up. Laura, let's see what you got. Yeah, I like this one too. So, you know, with this one here, let me move over so I'm on it. Okay, they want 3x plus 3y. So when I'm looking up at that problem, I'm thinking, how can I get a 3x and a 3y out of that? Well, if I multiply this entire bottom equation by negative one, now what happens is I have 7x minus 5y equals four, and then negative 4x plus 8y equals negative nine. Check it out, guys. When you add them together, you end up with 3x plus 3y. And then you immediately have your answer. It's negative five. Boom. Flawless. I would have done it the exact same way. Now, and here's the thing. You might say, well, hey, that was kind of lucky that you multiplied it by negative one and it worked out perfectly. But this is what the College Board does. Again, they're giving you a setup where this is doable over and over and over again. So be on the lookout. And not every system where they're asking for action expression versus just X or Y individually, it's not always going to work out so beautifully. But in the alternative, if you don't see that little shortcut, obviously you can still solve for the very variables individually, you can solve for X and solve for Y, but you just notice that's going to be a pain right here, right? Because what are we going to get for a common value to eliminate four and seven? 28. So you're doing some, some major multiplication, but you see that little nifty shortcut that Laura used was perfect. Okay. So now I'm going to show you how to do this in Desmos. Again, the main idea is this is the optimal method. I would do it the exact same way. I think it's the best for time, but we always want to have a backup of arsenals so that if you can't remember exactly how to do this or you don't see that trick and you just want to go straight to Desmos in a time crunch, you can do that. So let me show you how to do it. So by the way, guys, we are doing all these problems on the fly. Like we have not seen these problems before. This is literally just the first time that I saw that problem. So all these problems today we picked out for each other. We didn't share them with each other just so that you know. That's right. We do it the real way, the real deal, authentic test taking experience. Now, here we have the system graphed out, right, in Desmos. And again, we're looking for that intersection point. So you see, we get these not so nice decimals. So that's what I was saying before. If you solve from individually, you're going to kind of get messy responses. But that being said, this is still not the end of the world because what we can do is kind of enter this quick expression and then we can set C and D to those values of X and Y. 
So for C, which will be our X, I'm going to make it negative 0.361. And for D, I'm going to make it negative 1.306. And you can see we get that approximate answer. Obviously, it's not negative 5.001. This is from a rounding error, but it's negative 5. That's how you do it. All right, we're moving on to question three. Let's see if we can stump Laura this time. Take it away. Ooh, okay, so the given function F models the number of advertisements a company sent to its clients each year, where X represents the number of years since 1997. I like to annotate right on the function just so I can keep track of what's going on. So this is the number of years since 97, okay? And they said... Um, F models the number of advertisements a company sent to its clients. So this is F of X is the number of ads. Okay. Now we have um, X is between zero and five. So basically it starts at 97 and it goes up to 2002. So if Y equals F of X is graphed in the X, Y plane, which of the following is the best interpretation of the Y intercept. Okay. Whenever I see y-intercept, guys, I'm immediately thinking x equals zero. You want to make x zero because on the y-axis, that's what x always is. So when you have um, an equation like this, which is basically like an exponential decay equation, it, I know it's decay because it's less than one inside the parentheses, but if I put zero up there, what am I left with? Well, I basically have 9,000 times one, which is 9,000. So when I look at all the answer choices, I don't want to pick one that has 1708 in it. I want one with a 9,000. So I'm going to get rid of A and C. So then at that point, I need to figure out, okay, what is my F of X? It's the number of ads. Okay. Well, both of them say um, the number of ads, number of ads, but I need to understand what the graph looks like. And if it's an exponential DK, it's going to be going down like this. So if I'm at the Y intercept, I'm actually not going to be at the minimum number. I'm going to be at the highest amount. So I got to get rid of that and pick D. Okay, that was amazing. So again, you can you can plug this into Desmos if you just if you don't know that exponent rule. That'd be my only reason to even use Desmos here. But I think using Desmos here would just slow you down because even if you get that value, which we got with 9,000, which you kind of don't need it, you really don't need a calculator for, this now comes back to that interpretation question. And I would say another reason, to, and I, I liked how you, you drew the graph out and said, hey, wait, this isn't going to be a minimum. It's going to be a maximum, if anything. But the other thing to remember is, what is f of x? Is f of x talking about minimum values, or is that even part of what it describes? And we're talking about interpretation. You have to look at that. It says, no, it's simply the number of advertisements, right? And so there we go. Num Number of advertise, advertisements, nothing to do with minimum. So that was excellent. Wouldn't change a thing. We're both amazing. <laughs> <laughs> what can I say? What can I say? All right. Moving on to the next question. Here we go. And take it away. Oh, okay. So the given expression can be rewritten as, okay, I have two equations. One's got a constant in it. This screams Desmos to me. I'm going to put them both in Desmos and set a slider for A. If they say it can be rewritten as that, basically it means they're equivalent. So we want them to be equivalent expressions. So when you graph them in Desmos, you want one graph to overlap the other when you move it around, when you move the slider. All right, so let's let's see what happens when we start moving that A value around. And which which way do you want me to go? Down, uh, make it smaller, make it higher? Oh my gosh, you're making me think too much. Just move it and we'll decide. <laughs> Okay, down is good. Down is good. I could think about it, but it would take too much time. Okay, go up. There it is. Point. Well, get close, though. Get close. It doesn't look like it's quite there. All right, so we might need to change the step. Are you, are you going to try, like, point? Ooh, okay, okay. Oh, but I don't know if it's going to do it automatically. So we're, Oh, there we go. Oh, Wait. there it is. Oh, oh no, no, no. No, no, that's wrong. That's wrong. Okay. Shoot. Let's see. Well, that looks, did that work? Wow, that like actually looks right. Yeah, there it is. Wow! <laughs> Point zero 0.09 for the win. You know, I got to say something though about doing Desmos on that. You have to finesse it because it's a free response and that makes it trickier. You know, you have to know how to change your intervals. You got to change the step potentially. So you have to be like confident with your Desmos skills, I think. 
Go ahead. Do you have another way like you would do I, instead? I do have another way, and I'm going to tell So I like how you did it with Desmos. I'm just going to put down that answer that you got, 0. 0.09, and that was excellent. So to me, when I look at this immediately in my mind, I'm thinking just factoring because mm. it's like, you know, that's basically what they did is they factored this out. So th- yes. that's, where, that's where my mind went. Now, if I look at this equation, if I factor 0. 0.36 out, right, I'm going to get 1x squared, but I know I need to get a 4 out of here. So instead of factoring out, uh, let me think, instead of factoring out, actually, let's start there. I'm going to say factor out 0.36 first, and then I know I'm going to have 1x squared and then plus everything else. doesn't really matter because I know I need to get a 4 here, so that's what I'm concerned about. So now, if I know I want to get a 4 here, I need to factor out another 4. I need to basically divide that by 4, so then that way I'd have to add in a 4 to keep it balanced. And so right off the bat, now we can see that leading coefficient is 0.36 over 4, which is 0.09. I don't think that might, that may not be the most friendly way to approach it, but th- that's where my mind goes anyways when I see something like this and I see a common factor pulled out. I actually like your way better. I think it's faster. Yeah, it's just, a, it's, I think it's just might be confusing for people because, you know, the decimals and all the weird numbers. But again, right. we're, we're, we're choosing all, like, you'll notice every single question we're choosing is super hard because, again, we're trying to stump each other. All right, let's yeah. move on to the next one okay. and take it away. Ooh, okay. So here's another situation. We have C is a constant. They said they have one solution. If you wanted to do it algebraically, you could use a discriminant and set it equal to zero. I'm just going to go to Desmos again on this one because I love Desmos. So I would type it in. I want that vertex to touch the X axis just one time if there's one solution. Yes, perfect. Okay. So it looks like we're going to have to move it down. Okay. So you want me to go negative like this? Yeah. There it is. So if we zoom, if we zoom in, it, it's good to just zoom in, guys, just to make sure that it's right on the x-axis and we look good right there. So C is negative one. So we got C is negative one. Now I thought that was excellent, but but Laura mentioned something about the discriminant. Oh, and by the way, the other thing that she talked about, where hey, exactly one solution, right? That was a really good way that Laura put it in terms of hey, if, if I'm looking at the graph, that's where we're touching the x-axis. But another thing that may pop in your mind when you see a quadratic, and we're talking about number of solutions whether it's two one or zero it's all about the discriminant if you want to do it algebraically so just as a quick refresh i'm just going to throw that in here because i know you mentioned as well the discriminant is b squared minus 4ac and in this case that b squared is negative 8 so we got 64 minus 4 times a which is negative 16 times c which is literally c and again as Laura mentioned, that's when the discriminant equals zero, when we have one solution. And now you can see to solve this is pretty quick, right? 64, negative 4 times negative 16 is positive 64 equals zero, minus 64 from both sides, 64C equals negative 64, divide by 64, and we get C equals negative 1. That's how you do it. Boom, done. Boom. Okay. Now let's move on to question numero Five, my last chance at stumping Euro Laura. Five. Yeah, see, my Spanish is pretty legendary. <laughs> uh, okay, when you're when you're ready, take it away. All right. Ooh, this one looks fun. I like this one. Good choice. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna try to get fancy here, and I hope that this doesn't come back to bite me. But what I'm gonna do is I want to get both of them to just be a over b to do a quick comparison. So. This one I'm going to divide by 4 so that I'll just basically get rid of that 4 and I'll have A over B. So let me get out my calculator. And it's warming up. Sorry. You're good. I don't think, I think I had, like, I don't know when the last time was I used this thing. Okay, so we've got 6.7 divided by 4. So we have A over B is 1.675. Now, this one I'm going to multiply both sides by N to get rid of the N there. Which, al- which also means A over B equals 26.8 times N. So now what I'll do is I'll just set 1.675 equal to 26.8 N and divide by 26.8 to get N by itself since they wanted the value of N. And I got 0. 0.0625. 
Okay, I really like that, by the way. Was not going to be how I did it, which is, and, and actually, I think that was better than how I was going to do. So I'll just show you uh, what how I normally solve these proportions. Okay, uh, cool. Let me see if I can, I'm just going to erase some of this work so I can see the full equation, make sure I get it right. So usually what I do, I, I go, I mean, this was, it's substitute. You're still doing substitution, but I usually do like a single variable substitution. So let me give you an example. If I multiply this side by B, sort of like as if I'm cross multiplying, I get 4A equals 6.7B, and then I divide by 6.7. So I get B equals 4A over 6.7. And then I slot this in for B down here. But see, it's going to be messy. That's why your, your way actually I think is going to be much better. But then anyways, we get A over... 4a over 6.7. All right, this is like looking terrible now. I'm just about, <laughs> um, times n equals 26.8. And then we have this little equation where we can simplify from here. And you're, the a's are going to eventually cancel. I mean, I can, I can kind of cancel it out right now here. Let me, let me show you how I'll do it. I'll do it so we, we get rid of the a right off the bat. So if I'm doing a divided by this fraction, it's like a times the reciprocal, which is 6.7 over 4a n. That's going to go boom, boom, and cancel equals 26.8. Hold on. So now uh, you already did the division, so I know it's 1.675. So 6.7 divided by 4 is 1.675 over n equals 26.8. Gosh, this is really bad. But then I'd basically be multiplying by n and dividing by 26.8, just like uh, what Laura did here. So you can see, you can judge for yourself, but obviously I, I, I really like that method better. I hadn't thought about it. Now I'm stealing it. Well, I like the one that you did earlier too. Like that's what's so awesome about making this video with you is we learn from each other too. True. I love that. Laura, thank you so much for doing this with me. This was a blast and we're going to do it again, hopefully again and again and again, because I think this is a, this is really cool for people. Yeah, no, thank you so much for having me. I had so much fun and yeah, hopefully it was helpful to everybody that watched it. Awesome. All right. Thank you guys so much for joining and we will see you in the next video. Take it easy.